Welcome to the Golden Shadow. My name is Aaron Rogerson, and I'm here with Alyssa Polizzi. Excuse me. Today we are discussing the puer and the puella. Uh, puer and puella is Latin for boy and girl. Uh, the puer eternus is the eternal child. We're going to be exploring what that means. Um, we'll be exploring the dynamic between the puer and the senex. We'll be exploring the dynamic between the puer and the devouring mother. Um, we'll be contrasting the puer and the puella. Um, they have different energies, different stories, um, similar to what we've explored before in terms of the hero versus the heroine, for instance. Um, we did Princess Mononoke and we explored the wounded feminine versus the wounded masculine. So we'll be getting deeper into some of those ideas. So Alyssa, go ahead and start us off with some opening thoughts. We did an episode on the puer. It was, it was pretty early on, I think. And that really laid out a foundation of what we're talking about with the puer complex as is often referred to, but as a brief overview, we can look at this archetype of the puer, the young child, through the the spectrum of its expression, which on the positive side of the archetype often is associated to the divine child, which symbolizes potential new life, uh, the developing uh, personality, um, something that's very pure and yet unshaped, but brings this sense of regeneration, which is also why these figures mythologically have a lot to do with um, resurrection gods. But on the darker side of that archetype, the puer and puella tends to symbolize someone who has stayed too long in that adolescent psychology. Um, they're usually lacking a kind of mature attitude. They recoil from deeper responsibility. Um, they're living this sort of provisional life, you might say, a yet unlived life, and there's a stuntedness to it. So we're going to explore the different dynamics of the puer and puella in both its light and dark aspects and how it relates to other um, archetypes as well. If you were with us last week, we explored Cronus, and um, I don't know if we were conscious of this uh, or not, but the Cronus is often thought of as being an archetypal like a Senex character. So this would be a good episode to watch uh, along with last week's episode, um, which you can find very easily on our channel. Um, so uh, the Puer and the Puella. Here we have Hansel and Gretel. This is a pretty well-known fairy tale. Um, and uh, part of what we're going to try and emphasize here is that the Puer and Puella are pretty universal to our popular mythology nowadays. Um, so we're going to be going through a lot of different uh, pop culture stories, also mythology, and try to really illustrate that th this is sort of everywhere. Not only is it in all of our fiction, um, this the Puer archetype, uh, as a starting point for the hero's journey and the arc towards uh, growing up or individuating, but it's also universal inside each of us, right? Yeah. The Puer is what one might refer to also as like the inner child aspect. And that part of one's psychology is really ever present just as other aspects of uh, sort of archetypal expression are. But for certain people, they might identify with that aspect of the child to such a high degree that they lose that sort of path of maturation that we're all naturally following and sort of stop at an area where life still seems so fresh, so full of potential that it's hard to really ground into something very real or to sort of move more into those aspects of the Senex, which represent maturity and wisdom and the long held traditions. So you'll see as we move through a lot of these figures that what they share is their dynamic of wanting to stay in that energy of potential and new life and exploration and adventure right purity innocence um mm -hmm. without limitation yeah without limitation, that's that's certainly. a big part of it is uh when you're young you have 
all this potential to go in all these different directions. You have all these different paths that you could take through life. And mm -hmm. as we grow older, that those become more restricted, limited as time goes on until usually you were kind of forced onto a certain path. Um, and that is part of the, the beauty of children, right? Is, is their potential and their purity. Yeah. They haven't been spoiled yet. And they have so much life that they can bring into the world. And so we light up when we see children. So who's this? Okay, so kicking off some of the exploration into classic Puer Puellas is Eros or Cupid. We see him here with his baby <laughs> and fat baby with the wings on the on the right side here. He's with Aphrodite and Cupid or Eros, um, as he's referred to in the Greek side of things, has this strong relationship to the mother and the mother complex. And this is often a really big part when we look at the, the Puer archetype is the relationship to the parents, especially the mother and how that stuntedness sometimes comes from a relationship with a parental figure that has yet to grow into something where there is a healthy amount of differentiation between the parent and child. And that the parents need to hold on to the child perpetuates their adolescent psychology. Um, if you know anything about um, Eros's most famous story with Psyche, a lot of it, a lot of the strife that they're going through is because Aphrodite doesn't approve of Psyche as a lover of Eros. So you see how that can cause tension in the individual's relationship. Um, but what this also shows as well is that a lot of these figures often associated with the puer, um, a lot of the most common imagery of them is still as like very young children or as a young teenager as well. This is baby Jesus. Um, obviously Jesus has an arc. He has a story that um, his, his birth obviously is a pretty uh, prominent myth in Western culture uh, and Christianity. Um, there's the Immaculate Conception. He's uh, born in the manger. He has the, the three kings. He visit him and the shepherds. Um, and in Western art, baby Jesus is depicted a lot. So there's sort of an interesting dynamic with Jesus as his sort of uh, his baby self, child Christ, is um, pretty prominent, uh, the puer figure there, and what Jesus is going to become. Um, and oddly, there is sort of a, a large gap in uh, the mythology of Jesus um, between his, um, you might say, his puer state and uh, when he begins his main uh, teachings. So I, I believe between the ages of like 12 and 30, there's kind of like nothing, sort of. And then all of a sudden, there's a, a lot that focuses on one year of his life. Uh, I'm no scholar, though, so excuse me if I'm incorrect about that. Um, but what we'll see here is that there's there's an interesting interplay between uh, these puer figures, these sort of divine children uh, myths, and the dying and rising God that we'll see those kind of coming together in different myths. So Jesus is both the divine child, you can see him glowing in this image, but he's also a dying and rising God. He dies on the cross and he is resurrected. And we'll see that that's true um, with figures such as uh, Dionysus and Adonis um, and Persephone even. You're still on mute, Alyssa, but this is also baby Jesus, yeah. I believe. Yeah, um, I wanted to include this image because when we're talking about the relationship of the divine child with the mother, um, we see so much symbolism and the imagery with Mary holding on to baby Jesus. And so when he's depicted through the divine child lens, um, and frankly, even throughout more of his arc um, as a sort of messiah and his death and the role still that his mother plays and the role that she uh, sort of plays in the religion as a whole is so important. So there really is no Jesus without Mary. So you see him sort of cradled safely in her arms here, or you have 
you know, her um, part of her sorrows being, you know, his crucifixion. And so her relationship to him is extremely important. Um, and often it is a mother figure that are tied to the puer puella. And it's that, that axis between them that kind of creates it sort of it just seems to constellate something in in the psyche that uh, brings forth the the child parent relationship to such a degree that it can either stunt um, an individual but also sort of give life to the, the the sort of divinity in the child as well. <laughs> okay, we got we have Dionysus here as a baby. <laughs> Dionysus has an interesting origin story, birth story, and there's yeah. there's a lot of different interpretations of uh, Dionysus' birth I, right. um, and, and, and rebirth. Versions, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's versions where he is um, born once and then uh, dies and then is born again. Yeah. Well, he's in... Two different mothers. Yeah. In, in the Orphic tradition, you have more like Dionysus Zagreus, who's born from Persephone and Zeus and then is torn apart by the Titans um, and then reborn. Um, then you have a version of Dionysus that is connected to the Eleusinian mysteries, which is that the sort of the culmination of the the mystery, at least in one in one aspect, is the birth of this child, Iacus, uh, who later became associated to Dionysus. And so the Eleusinian mysteries are uh, sort of circumambulating death, rebirth. Um, themes as well. So Dionysus is another figure. And I think just what he represents in a more general sense as this ecstatic figure of wine and ecstasy and uh, ritual sort of, uh, I don't know, partying. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. It's very childlike, right? Like it's the Dionysian principle in contrast to the Apollonian principle. And although Apollo isn't himself like a Senex figure, I know that sometimes people view a Dionysian um, mentality as much more puer and the Apollonian as much more Senex in nature because it's more ordered, um, structured, uh, clear cut versus the wildness of Dionysus. And that, that to me, I think, can be part of the, the puer psychology. Yeah, I, I mean, if you want to see a, a, a group of adults regress into a childlike state, you get them drunk. <laughs> it's true. Right? It's true. So al yeah. Alcohol has that effect for sure. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. All right, this is a little baby Buddha. It's a baby Krishna. <laughs> baby Krishna. <laughs> Although a baby Buddha, it, okay. I thought we should have had baby Buddha on here, but we forgot that one. It's something that I thought about but forgot to bring up is that we have all of these really powerful. Uh, god figures deities and there's often a child representation of them so you have like a child buddha you've got child jesus here we have krishna um and in hinduism there's it it's a polytheistic culture so there's tons of gods but one version of krishna is as this child and it's interesting because he's very he's very hermes like he's known as like a trickster and a, and a thief um and as uh, this kind of agile youth, and we'll see here, um, this is supposed to be baby Hermes stealing Apollo's cattle, but some of these divine children or these gods who come up in childlike form, when they manifest as a child, carry this intense purity of like child, uh, th this childlike tricksterness too which is like the wild imagination, the ability to just do things without a sense of repercussion. Um, so when Hermes is born, before he can even walk or so everyone thinks, he leaps out of his cradle, he goes and steals all of Apollo's cattle and goes and hides them somewhere. So he's immediately known as this trickster god and this sort of playful child who we, we see sort of thematically in Krishna as well. The link between the uh, the trickster and the puer and the mm -hmm. fool is all mm -hmm. very interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, and a lot, sure. a lot of figures that are trickster gods or, or trickster um, trickster heroes, um, they're associated with sort of bringing a, a new wisdom 
or, or bringing some sort of um, new knowledge to a certain group of people. So like that, that's true for uh, Prometheus, for instance, as it bringing the fire to the humans mm -hmm. is he's a trickster character. Um, and you can see how that applies to uh, someone's tendency to kind of rock the boat or break up boundaries or kind of take something that is established as being true and kind of turning it on its head mm. is a very mm -hmm. trickster thing to do. And then a lot of insight actually comes from that kind of behavior of being willing to sort of deframe and reframe things and turn yeah. things on their head and sort of break limits. And then a lot of humor is actually doing that. When we make jokes, we're actually sort of uh, cracking open certain structures and mm. turning them upside down. And that's kind of why it's funny. And so the link between wisdom and tricksterness um is is apparent there and it's um also something that's true for the puer right so yeah. children can be very trickstery not not always so a lot of children are just sort of very shy and obedient but um like when i was a child i was super super trickstery and very silly all the time and i could never i could never take like a serious photo and i was always trying to pull pranks on people and make jokes um and as I grew up, I became more serious, right? Mm -hmm. But the, you, you can see that the, the childlike ability to approach things in a new way and not take things so seriously yeah. and kind of turn things upside down um, is part of the path to new insight and wisdom. So the, the links here between these different things, the fool, the trickster, the puer, yeah, are quite, yeah. quite interesting. Yeah. Just going back to this real quick, we, we should have... We should have thought of the Buddha story to add here because the, the True, Buddha yes, uh, yeah. the Buddha as uh, Siddhartha and as the prince and he leaves his prince um, uh, his his kingdom his his royalty he right. leaves it to, to travel and becomes the Buddha and that's a, a good good illustration of the puer kind of falling from protection and traveling and becoming the Senex as the Buddha. Yeah, you're trying to think of a good story. That would have been a good one right there. Yeah, especially because Siddhartha lives in this kind of paradise. It's very protected. He doesn't know that people suffer on the outside. He doesn't know that they are in need. Um, and as he starts to realize that, he decides to leave that kind of known world and embark on that hero's journey. But his becomes like uh, a messianic hero's journey, right? Like he, mm -hmm. he becomes this figure that leaves behind not only naive Puer, um dynamics but turns into uh kind of like the ultimate religious godlike figure anyways here's some children uh, the point is kind of to illustrate here that uh part of the importance of the puer as an archetype and why it's so powerful for us why it's so compelling and why we play with it so much in our mythology is that because uh each of us used to be children right there is no one alive who was never a child at some point. And so each of us has this energy in us um, as a you know very concrete experience of the past, um, but also as something that continues to live on inside us, right? That's important for us to access, important for us to be in touch with. Mm -hmm. And that a lot, of, uh, a lot of our trauma is linked to a child state, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of um, our pathologies our mental pathologies are linked to some sort of disowning of the child or disconnection from the child or, or losing that puer like quality, yeah. which actually causes us to enter a um, broken sort of dysfunctional state. So we're going to keep bringing that up, that this is inside of us all the time. It used to be us and it's still inside of us. And trying to get back into the childlike state is actually quite important to personal growth. Um, so pretty much in all of our popular fiction, all, all, all of the sort of hero's journey formulas that have produced all these crazy blockbusters and, uh, gets recycled over and over and over again. Um, almost all these stories have to do with a puer, um, the hero's journey, uh, very precisely deals with some sort of puer state there's always the protected hero who's living in a sort of spoiled or um safe lifestyle uh protect from danger either uh if that's living with his on uncle like luke 
or living under the stairs like Harry or living at Winterfell like John. Um, there's all these states of uh, sort of idyllic, safe, um, not exposed to danger, not exposed to the darkness of, of the real world. Um, and you can see this is so prominent in all of the really, really popular stories that we tell. And it comes up again and again, this um, state of purity, this this blank slate, the fool who doesn't know anything, um, the hero who at some point is going to be pushed out of the safe state or maybe chooses to and venture into uh, danger, venture into the unknown, venture into chaos in order to like have that arc towards becoming an adult. Um, so that's played with again and again. Uh, obviously there's female versions of that. Um, these are also very popular myths in our culture, um, at least for sure in the last like two decades or so. That's Katniss from uh, Hunger Games. Hunger Games. Then uh, we have uh, Bella from Twilight. <laughs> Uh, and that's important because Be Bella is like a heroine and her, her story is not quite the same as like Luke's story, but like, mm. it's still the same thing. She's still, um, sort of an innocent protected girl who is exposed to like the darkness of the vampire world and has to engage in this journey. Arya on the right, obviously still Game of Thrones. Um, so, um, there's, uh, Puer archetypes here. There's Puella archetypes here. Is there a difference? I would say so, yes. We'll kind of get into that. This can be kind of controversial in some ways because, you know, I, I would argue, for instance, that Arya, her arc is a hero's arc and not really a heroine's arc, though it's dancing in between them in some way. It's obviously not just pure masculine energy. Yeah, it, it's like an interesting mix because, and maybe this is just insightful for like often the heroine's journey has a lot to do with the, a lot of difficulty around the feminine principle and in contrast to a lot of other figures in Game of Thrones who sort of step into these roles of, of the wife or the queen very easily, Arya strives to want to be like her brother. She wants to, she doesn't want to do what the girls have to do. And her, we don't really see her complete this arc, but often like the heroine does have this dissociation from the feminine principle and it's through the heroine's journey that she comes to a new understanding and a new relationship with it so she's playing with that in her early story although i don't know if she ever really re completes that return or sort of a transformation you might say for the heroine but the point is that it's universal um the archetypes that we're exploring here the Puella and the Puella, Puella are universal and like i said we all used to be children it's all inside of us and that's the reason that these myths are so compelling that if you were to have for instance um a game of thrones universe that's solely focused on the adults um it wouldn't be as compelling as a story and if you had a myth where Luke is already a Jedi master. He's already the most powerful Jedi and you just start the story there. It's not compelling for some reason because it doesn't really tap into the 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 inner child that needs to go through changes in order mm -hmm. to have the, the revolution of self. Mm -hmm. So the Puer Puella is universal in these pop myths for that reason because it it really grabs us and it taps into something that we know to be very true. And so Alyssa brought up this um, amazing piece of fan art that she drew. <laughs> she drew this herself. Shut uh, up. Oh no, we, we, actually, we, actually, we, couldn't, we couldn't find a very good image of the children of Game of Thrones, but this one works. Um, but you can see like Game of Thrones, obviously like we, we like Game of Thrones because it, it's so deep. It has every, every theme that you can think of is kind of in Game of Thrones because it's so huge as a universe. So we come back to it again and again. But yeah. um, the Game of Thrones myth uh the show the books they really even though they have a huge cast of characters and there's all kinds of different themes at play the main the main thread of game of thrones is beginning with and ending with the stark children so they are the focus of the story everything kind of revolves around them um for the most part and even the chapters in the books are usually I think mostly told from their perspective, if you were to actually like go through each of the chapters. 
um, even though it varies quite a bit. But the point is that the the the, the childlike state of the story uh, starting there is very very important, and it makes um, the the whole universe so compelling to travel with these children as they grow and have their vicissitudes and succeed and fail and change. And the story ends with them still um, in a changed state. Yeah. Studio Ghibli. It's a whole, it's a whole universe of Pu'er and Puella stories. There's this aspect, wouldn't you say, are in that maybe part of what is so fascinating and so popular about Ghibli is that it continues this thread of the child's initial experiences moving through these different challenges to sort of either push them out of Pu'er state or just to explore their Pu'er Puella state. And each movie has a major component or a major character that ultimately surrounds what it means to be the child and what it's like to experience like a depth of imagination and also like the, the depth of confusion that comes from, from being a child. Yeah. Um, again, fractals here, there's, there's stuff happening on multiple levels always mm -hmm. with these things. And so at, at one level, the, all of the studio Ghibli films focus on a child, like pretty much yeah. like varying states of childhood. Like for, for instance, my neighbor Totoro is, really childlike as a story mm -hmm. um and then princess mononoke for instance is a like kind of more adult but it's still youth the focus um in every studio ghibli film is on a child and so there's there's they're compelling for that for that reason we really enjoy that um and part of it is again as i just said starting with the 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 Puer and Puella archetype is compelling to us as as an arc but it's also what Studio Ghibli does really, really well is it actually not only focuses on those archetypes, but it really brings you into the childlike state. So mm -hmm. if, if you watch My Neighbor Totoro or Ponyo, for instance, um, it's really kind of like being a kid. It's like mm -hmm. the, the way it's directed, the colors, what's happening. Uh, like if you can just sort of let yourself get immersed in the movie and maybe you, you know take some stuff, substances to help you do that, it's actually almost like you're re-entering the childlike state and like everything's kind of like, ah, like, oh, look how pretty it is. And like, oh, look at the cute, like big furry thing. Like, oh, like they're running. You know, it's like you actually kind of return there and that's enjoyable to access that state. And so it's something that Miyazaki, I think, honed in on quite well is not only exploring uh, the eternal child as mm -hmm. an archetype, but also getting you to enter into it as you watch which is, you know, again, it it's very uh, enriching and nourishing to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Simpsons, uh, again, another popular universe. We, we haven't explored The Simpsons much, and maybe we should, because similar to Game of Thrones, it kind of just like has everything. <laughs> like yeah. Every single theme is in there. Every single arc is in there. Every character, every every archetypal character or personality is in the Simpsons. Um, like they have like, uh, you know, guys who hang out at a bar and then they have like a rich old evil man. And then they have, um, you know, a mad scientist. They have all these different themes they can explore. Um, and the core family that they focus on the Simpsons as a family, um, part of why it's so powerful as a universe is that they have an adult man, they have an adult woman, they have a little boy and they have a little girl and they have a baby. And so that's a lot of um, ammunition to work with archetypal ammunition. You might say to take all these different trajectories. And so, you know, Bart has his own episodes that focus on him and he follow Bart around as the Puer and he has his own arcs that he gets into and he has his own lessons that he needs to learn. He has his own shortcomings. Like he's, uh, kind of portrayed as being a little stupid and ignorant and reckless and uh, doing dangerous things all the time and causing trouble and not obeying the rules, getting in trouble at school. And like, that's very puer and that's a real life experience for a lot of young boys. Um, and you have Lisa and you have similar 
threads, but they're very different and they're exploring different themes about what it means to be a young girl. Um, and, you know, Lisa approaches them a lot differently than Bart. So Lisa doesn't have a slingshot. She has a saxophone. Um, and when she has like an issue, she takes a more feminine approach to it, possibly trying to engage with it through conversation and um, mediation, as opposed to Bart, who's going to take a skateboard and, you know, <laughs> jump over it or something. Yeah. The, the Simpsons does offer like this really wide range of archetypal expression, but would you say that maybe Bart, I'm not sure about Lisa, but like, I just feel like as popular as Homer is, as popular as so many of the other characters are, like Bart Simpson really seems to be like, in some ways, like the major star or has maybe even created the most sort of continued meme-like associations to the show. Um, I don't know if you would agree with that. Yeah, I don't know. It, it'd be interesting to, to hear from someone who's more of an expert on The Simpsons. I mean, yeah. obviously, I, I've watched a lot of The Simpsons mm -hmm. growing up. Like, it was definitely like one of my favorite shows when I was a kid. And I still think it's great. I still think it's like a really, really brilliant work of art. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's still going, I guess. And I yeah. haven't watched it in like 10 years. But um, Bart does seem to have more of a prominent place uh, in the pantheon of pop culture, you yeah. might say. And part of it's his hair. Uh, part of it's his name, Bart. Mm. Like It's like a weird name. Mm. But you also have to wonder if there's something about the times we live in where a trickster uh rebel stupid kid has more resonance with us yeah. than lisa who's kind of like you know, like a goody two-shoes like smart person um yeah, i'm just riffing here i haven't thought about this at all but like sure. again you know like a lot of like really popular media as of late is like uh the bad guy is the main character so like you have like you have sopranos you have breaking bad hmm. um you have that's another good example that's all i can think of right now but either way the, the, these are really popular things to explore is like criminal fiction hmm. people who are breaking the rules men who like don't give a shit and do what they want yeah. uh there's something mythologically very compelling about that even though most people would never actually do anything like Tony Soprano has done watching Tony Soprano do what he does uh is really entertaining and it speaks to something about us of like we want to break free we want to break the rules mm -hmm. we're living in some sort of strange mental prison of capitalism or whatever um so anyways Tony Soprano that's a whole different story the Sopranos is great and also Tony is also like a kind of a poor figure yeah I was gonna he, say <laughs> super childlike he like refuses to play by anyone's rules he does whatever yeah. he wants all the time he wants to have a ton of mistresses and still have his wife and they explore that in the show with his therapist that he is sort of um just like this big baby yeah. even though he's like a crime boss yeah. so that's again interesting stuff to play it's it's about. a good example of seeing the puer at play even as an individual has aged mm -hmm. which is like a big part of exploring the, the problem of the Puer Eternus is that long after they should have grown out of this, you know, a an adult is still living in this adolescent dynamic and it, it can wreak an immense amount of havoc on people's lives and their own life, of course. Some more examples of pop culture, Puer Puella, the, how fascinating it is to us, Calvin and Hobbes, Peanuts. Yeah, like newspaper strips, a lot, a lot of uh, newspaper to comic strips involve children for some reason. That's interesting. We, we, it's you can you can play with um, a, ch a child's reality um, much more freely, much more nimbly than you can an adult's reality. Um, so, like Calvin, for instance, uh, you know he's depicted as a, a real boy with a real life and has has to go to school, but he's also seems to be able to just sort of get into these crazy dreamlike adventures where he's um you know running through the forest and climbing up trees and building forts and, and building gigantic s snowmen that would be impossible for anyone to build but he's kind of through hit through calvin's eyes there's sort of a fantasy world where anything is possible that we're exploring and his responses to things can be very funny because they can be so irresponsible 
Like mm. his parents will say things like, you know, like eat your vegetables and he can, you know, snap back with some remark that is like ignorant and doesn't make any sense. Um, but it's, it's entertaining because he doesn't have any responsibilities to eat his best vegetables and he doesn't need to do his homework. And that's partly what's fun about the comic. Yeah. Um, it's entertaining and comedic, but it still fills us with a, a sense of meaning. Um, and there's still, obviously there's some deep themes in Calvin and Hobbes that are still explored, uh, and some difficult, you know, comics where like Calvin like loses Hobbes, for instance, like Hobbes is like stolen by a dog, like the dog bites the stuffed animal and runs away. And so there's still deep themes of, you know, loss and what it means to be a kid that are explored. Yeah. But again, the, uh, the child allows us to kind of explore it in this more free, open way. Um, the same way that a lot of, uh, you know, television shows involving children, like high school kids, like there's all these fantastical, ridiculous things that can happen to them because uh, they don't have jobs and they don't have any responsibility. And in these shows, you also have to often wonder, like, where are the parents? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do these kids get away with these crazy adventures? And it's like, well, that's don't worry about that. So that's part, part of part of living through the archetype of Tapuer is expansive and open to potential impossibilities in that way. Yeah. Another example of like the Puer child hero, Aang from uh, Avatar and Goku from Dragon Ball. I like these two especially because they're, they have such a purity of like childlike essence. And with Aang, as he sort of like reawakens um, and is told that he has this like deep responsibility to be the Avatar, to kind of be the mediating force to bring peace to the land. Um, there's a lot of resistance. And so that like reluctance that we sometimes see in the hero archetype comes, I think, from the association to the Pu'er, where there's a sense of wanting to shirk that responsibility. Um, it's too overwhelming. But if they are able to successfully step up to that challenge, they leave that aspect of Pu'er and step further into adulthood so that Aang eventually, you know, becomes what he's meant to be and establishes peace and grows up and has a family. And Goku, maybe you could speak more to Goku, but they, <laughs> they, they explore after Dragon Ball, obviously Dragon Ball Z, and he's got kids. And But I don't know. It's so crazy. There's so many weird battles and monsters. But he's also a, a, a young child like Pu'er hero who eventually steps into maturity as well. Yeah, interesting themes there. Um, you know, uh, part part of the the lesson through both Ain and Goku's story is that their their childlike state is actually a advantage mm. that helps mm. them throughout their story. Uh, Ain's Ain's ability to have fun and be, be playful and make friends and kind of see things on the bright side mm. is partly what gives him such an advantage against uh, some of his nemeses who are kind of. Uh, narrow focused and darker in their outlook, more cynical, more yeah. serious. Um, so Ayn is always sort of getting his, his comrades around him to have more fun and to look at things differently. And so you have that kind of that trickster notion going on of like turn things upside down their head. Like uh, Ayn, he's like, instead of training, why don't we go, you know, uh, sledding on penguins? Mm. Um, you know, it's like, you should be training and like, you know, but part of part of Ayn's outlook of being trickstery and open minded and seeing the beauty on things actually gives him this advantage that allows him to transcend yeah. and become such a, a brilliant uh, bender and, you know, defeat the uh, the fire fire lord eventually. Um, and Goku also, uh, you know, he's he's strangely because even in Dragon Ball Z and the connection between Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z is complicated and, you know, they're two very different works but um even as an adult goku is still like really childlike and still really silly and he doesn't take things very seriously except when he trains he takes that incredibly seriously uh but he's like the most powerful you know fighter in the universe but he's also like just like this dumb kid who wants to play around and goof off um but again it's it's sort of portrayed as an advantage he has this advantage because not only is he uh got a grasp on his adult nature and the responsibility of being powerful, you know, like with, with great power comes great responsibility, but he also knows how to remain in the childlike state and that like ideally 
that's true for all of us is that we have a grip on adult life. We can support ourselves. We can support a family. We're responsible, but we don't abandon childhood in the process and lose the ability to be open-minded and have fun and look on the bright side and see beauty and, uh, you know, look out at our life and be like, wow, everything's so, everything's so amazing and pretty, yeah. uh, like children do. Yeah. Some examples of individuals who, <laughs> who aren't maintaining that balance very well. <laughs> what movie is this from? This is from is Step, Brothers. Step Brothers. <laughs> Step Brothers. Yeah. Uh, real quick before we move on, I wanted to, um, yeah. uh, Michael's comment here, I thought was really okay. good. Uh, and this is a, a, a again, a, a good rewording of sort of the power of the Pu'er is that you know through through children um, we can actually break the frame of mm. adulthood and yeah. uh, that like he's saying I think children through humor can actually be truth tellers and critiques of our adult frames so yeah. again as as we grow up and mature we do have adult frames that kind of lock us into a certain way of living um, and that like literally children can come along and be like you know why are you living that way that seems stupid you're not having mm. any fun. Mm. Um, or children can say things that like you wouldn't say if you were an adult. Yeah. Like, um, you know, like grandma, you seem unhappy. It's like, Shh, like, don't say that. That's rude. You know, but like children are actually, they're just speaking truth and they're breaking these adult frames that often don't actually serve us, um, well in every context. Um, yeah. so again, that's a lot of what these, this fiction is doing is that like kind of through the eyes of the Pu'er we're sort of. Uh, returning to a, 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 a new state that is revitalizing and enriching and um, resurrecting, you might say. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, Step Brothers. So uh, I, I, again, sort of exploring the pervasiveness of the the Pu'er in, in different ways. Like you know, we we talked about the Pu'er as in hero heroes journeys. And then, you know, Calvin and Hobbes comic strips, and then we have like Ain and Goku. Um, and right here we have like a different manifestation of the Pu'er, which is that a lot of a lot of really popular modern humor that we have, um, like live action humor, is <laughs> very juvenile and that it's it's enjoyable. I mean, Step Brothers is a ridiculous movie. Um, if you haven't seen it, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I would say it's a good movie, honestly, but it's it's so stupid and so absurd that it's it's fun to kind of just enter into that state again. Um, Will Ferrell and John C. Riley are really good at <laughs> at channeling that energy. Obviously, they're they're professional actors. They clearly are adults and they have lives and they have families, but they're able to kind of uh, for the camera enter into this childlike state. Uh, if you watch bloopers of them interacting, like they're just improvising so much of this and they're just having fun and they're trying to channel the Pu'er. So Will Ferrell, you know, is kind of a master of channeling the Pu'er. Mm. Um, and part of why it's funny is because he's so, he's such a grown man and like physically, but he's really good at just like this juvenile, ridiculous humor um in most of his movies and that's kind of what he's a master at and like and we love it we're very entertained by that breaking of the frame again the adult frame um you can also see it in the uh, you know like jackass for instance is like really popular show they had another movie come out recently but jackass as a show is just super juvenile it's, it's just it's grown men behaving like 12 year olds and guess what it's really popular like people love it yeah. um so that's it's interesting to observe this in a culture and pulling dynamite also you know a movie that's really exploring strange pu'er energy and napoleon is a hero and he's a hero because he's so childlike and so uh kind of oblivious and naive um and we find that really funny and really entertaining endearing he's also a bit of like a, a fool hero right like he's sort yeah. of it's not only like childlike and sort of silly, but he seems to sort of lack like a depth of intelligence. And that foolishness actually is quite powerful in being able mm -hmm. to, as we've been saying, like shake up that frame. So Pu'er, fool, hero with, with Napoleon. Um, so comparing Pu'er and Pu'er, um, these slides, uh, Again, we're talking about kind of hero, hero versus heroine journeys. Um, part of the Pu'er energy, uh, you know, that you see. This is this is Siegfried, 
and he's um, a hero. He's also he's very youthful, obviously, in this image. Um, but he holds a sword. His um, engagement with sort of archetypal chaos in his life is in the form of this giant serpent. Uh, he kills the serpent, so he slays the beast. Um, on the other side, we have Belle from Beauty and the Beast, and she also has to tangle with the beast in some way. She has to tangle with the dragon, uh, but it's different, right? It's a very different interpretation. So Siegfried slaughters this chaos with a sword, whereas Belle tames it, like mediates it. Mm. Um, in this, she actually marries it, essentially, but that's like an interesting trade-off between the Puer and the Puella. Um, and you know, if we were going to contrast the Puer and the Puella, what would you, what would you, what would you say, Alyssa, is sort of defining characteristics about their stories? Well, I, I think in some ways you have to accept that there's like a level of crossover because we're dealing with what is just pure childlike challenge and inflation and association to like the child archetype that no matter if it's a Puer or Puella, we see that stuntedness, we see the resistance to responsibility. Um, but where I think the Puer tends to move a little bit more towards um, that juvenile nature that has like a markedly masculine quality to it, like Aang or like Goku or even like the the stepbrothers or the jackass kind of dynamic, the Puella sort of sometimes might create like this energy around herself that is like a, a an imagination, an imaginal quality that keeps her both dissociated from a lot of individuals, but also herself. Um, and we tend to see a lot of the struggles of like the Puella as like a, as a dissociation from themselves that I don't feel like we often see with the Puer archetype. Um, like Arya, I think is like a good example where her identity as a female in the house of Stark and what it means to turn into that, what it means to become a mother, what it means to become a wife is so overwhelming or um, so not her that she totally cuts it off to a very, very strong degree and then can go really far in the other direction. Or you have like the Disney princess Puellas who create this um, idealized states of love that are so mm, unrealistic that they're, they're unmatched. So I think you have both a, a, a really strong dissociation from say like the, the Puella feminine um, aspect and also the the overabundant uh, of uh, imaginal possibility that really still takes them um, out of reality. The Disney Princess is um, you know more of the thematic structure that, that Disney played with classically for for a long time mm -hmm. is is movies involving a female protagonist, um, which is interesting. Um, and you know why? Why do you think that is that Disney has spent so much time focusing on a female protagonist and the princess figure? No, yeah. it's interesting. I think, in part, I don't know. I don't. I don't have a lot of history of Disney, but what I know in terms of like the source material is that most of this are old fairy tales, old European fairy tales. And what we're often seeing is the exploration of Puella or Puer figures, but that in, in some ways there's a kind of strange magic that comes with the Puella fairy tale story. And I think especially when you take the bare bones skeleton of the story and instead of having some of the harshness or the intensity that you see in the original source material and you kind of have this overlay of like Disney magic and nicety. Um, okay, I'll give you an example, right? So like with the Cinderella story, when the when the sisters are trying to try on the slipper to um, have the prince choose them to be his wife, like the shoes like make their feet bloody 
and <laughs> um, or like their feet like get cut off or something like that. There's all this like really crazy intense symbolism that you'll see in all of these original stories. I think in the Little Mermaid, Ariel actually dies or something like that. I can't remember. But point being that there's it's really tapping into a lot of potent sort of unconscious uh, archetypal symbolism, but then we get to dress it up as something even sort of more safe and fantastical. And in some ways that's even more, uh, it's tapping even more into the aspects of our own Puer Puella psychology because all of that rawness, harshness, violentness of life, you know, Siddhartha in the castle is like, we're keeping the bubble around us. So, you know, for some reason they've chosen the, the, the princesses, but they've really dressed it up in a way that, that really constantly, I think the relationship to the Puer Puella in, inside of us. Here's Milan. Milan is obviously a story of the dance between um, the masculine and the feminine. Um, so Milan's story is interesting. Um, is it a heroine's journey? Like, yeah, it kind of is. Is mm -hmm. it a hero's journey? Yeah, it kind of is. So it's like, it's sort of in between. And yeah. that's why it's, it's an interesting myth to explore. Um, one of the big facets um, of the uh, Puer idea, um, the, Puer, the Puer as um, someone who refuses to grow up. And uh, obviously we have... Um, Peter Pan syndrome is a pretty well-known uh, pop psychology concept mm -hmm. nowadays, uh, probably because I, I think it's so prominent in our culture and that um, not only are a lot of us not growing up as fast as people used to in the past, I would say that about myself. Um, I think all of us would probably say that about ourselves as well. Um, but we probably know people um, or have known individuals who uh, are seemingly exhibiting Peter Pan syndrome. Um, so uh, trying to figure out the reasons for that is complicated. I think I think that it's it's obviously you know very very complex, multi-layered. Um, but the Peter Pan myth. Um, here's Peter with his lost boys. Part of the plot is that they live in Neverland. They don't ever grow up. Um, the the lost boys as it implies is like they're kind of lost they haven't they haven't been able to find their path and they're happy to stay in this sort of fantasy dreamland um and it, just to interject a little bit here what's yeah. interesting also about the lost boys and this is a good image to bring up it's like they meet the mother you know and like wendy oh. comes in as that figure that even though they're perpetuating and happy to be in Neverland and to not grow up and to want to stay these like rough and tumble boys and be dirty and, you know, roll in the mud and fight. They still yearn for the nurturance of a, a parental like figure, which I think is often very important for the Puer Puella because the child can, does not know how to survive on its own. It doesn't know how to have nurturance um, that it creates rather than somebody else um, it, it doesn't know how to tend to itself in the same way that a parent can. And if that relationship had gone well, by the time you reach that point of initiation into adulthood, the parent stops doing it for you and the child does it for themselves because now they are an adult. Um, but here we see that there's the yearning and the need and the kind of void for that mother figure that Wendy so perfectly fills for them. Here's Peter um, recoiling from a kiss from Wendy, uh, <laughs> yeah. and so uh, a lot of the time, what what a a boy needs to grow up is to interact with his either his feminine side and explore sort of the shadow of mm. of the way that he lives, or he actually literally needs a woman to come into his life and um, you know bring him into balance. And you know this is something that you see around you happen to people or happens to you. Um, if you're a man, is that a, if a woman comes into your life, she kind of forces you to change or to even compromise or to let go of certain things that you want to hold on to. And maybe you stop playing with toys so much and you start learning how to support a family, um, or, you know, clean up your room or something like that. So the, the feminine energy entering your life is something that can wake someone up out of the puer state 
and bring them into adulthood. Peter obviously is, is, you know, kind of resisting that, like what, you know, he doesn't want to be sexualized. Mm. Um, he doesn't want to have a kid. Uh, you can see Tinkerbell here sort of attacking Wendy and, and Tinkerbell is kind of maybe the, uh, sort of embodiment of, um, child Art. dreamlike energy. Yeah. But keeping, also keeping like a, yeah, a bit of like a, a devouring mother figure as well. She wants to keep Peter for herself <laughs> and she does mm -hmm. kind of take care of him. Tinkerbell does sort of act as like a semi mother-like figure for the lost boys. Um, but the a big important point here really is that romantic relationship takes you out of the individualism that you have been operating in up until that point. And suddenly there is an other. And by entering into relationship with a, a romantic figure, you are forced to compromise. You are forced to be uh, pushed against your boundaries. You are forced to figure out how to care for another and meet their needs. And this is a huge part of, of maturity. And an aspect of the Puer Puella is that they will jump from re relationship to relationship. Like maybe sure they'll engage um, in romantic dynamics with people, but will they stay with them? Will they commit? Will they feel that this person just doesn't have what's right? And so they keep moving from person to person. So another aspect really of, of the complex that's important to take note of. Yeah, I mean, some 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 puers or puellas will uh, engage in a romantic relationship, but they will only um, what's the word? They will they will only tolerate a partner who lets them do whatever they want. Mm. Essentially, mm. so if they if they don't really need to change at all, and they don't really need to conform to any sort of rules or sacrifice or give up uh, what they're holding on to, they'll gladly accept a romantic partner. Um, except it's not really. I mean, again, semantics here. Is it truly a romantic partner if this person isn't changing you at all? <laughs> like, is that romance? Yeah. Romance is usually sort of a coming together and sort of actually like a shifting of yourself into something that's more merged. But a a, uh, a man with Peter Pan syndrome will likely latch on to a partner that doesn't challenge them at all. And they will try to maintain that as long as possible. That's something yeah. else that you can observe, I think. Um, interesting comparison here between Peter Pan and Hermes. I think that is somewhat intentional by the creator of Peter Pan. Um, Possibly. Hard yeah. to know. There's some stuff on Wikipedia, I think, about that, that Hermes and Peter Pan have some sort of um, relationship that's intentional. But the uh, trickster figure flying around, going between the waking world and the dream world or the overworld and the underworld. Mm. Um there is some aspect of children's ability to do that, right? To kind of yeah. play between worlds. Yeah. And I wouldn't consider Hermes to be like a very classic Puer figure, but he has a lot of Puer like qualities and is always um, kind of imaged as a youth, young adult, you might say, but has some of those Puer like qualities that allow for him to kind of move between the worlds in a, in a different way compared to some of the other Greek gods. A good example of the Puella in Greek mythology is Artemis, who asked of her father Zeus to be granted <laughs> a couple of requests. One of them is to uh, be a virgin forever, to never have to give herself up to another, never have to be married, and he grants that request. So Artemis, Athena, Hestia are known as the virginal goddesses, which immediately put them in sort of Puella status. Um, and one of the popular, most famous myths of um, Artemis is that the actor, or the actor, the hunter Acteon, came upon her and her nymphs while they were bathing. And she was so affronted by him um, seeing her and her ladies naked. And you might say that this is like getting too close to that boundary of sexuality um, and of relationship, especially by something as foreign as the masculine that she turns him into a stag and his hunting dogs rip him apart. So her resistance and her boundaries from between herself and that romantic sexual layer of experience 
uh, constellates actually quite a violent response. Um, and sort of symbolically, we can see that as within an individual, a, a complete repelling of relationship. Like this, uh, the type of Artemisian woman is going to be someone who fears relationship or recoils from it very, very deeply, doesn't even want to get close to it because it feels like such a threat. So her Puella aspect um, comes out very strongly and similar to some of the other figures in the Puer Puella dynamic, um, sometimes they do engage in romantic relationships, but other times they stay virginal their entire life. Here's Persephone. Um, Persephone, again, has a sort of dying and rising goddess thing going on. Mm -hmm. uh, we already did an episode on per Hades and Persephone. That was a month ago, I think, but you can look that up. Um, but Persephone is uh, Kore, meaning mm -hmm. maiden, originally. She's out here. She's innocent. She's pure, virgin, uh, picking flowers. Hades um, kidnaps her. He rapes her. Um, and she becomes queen of the underworld. But there is this notion of her traveling between worlds. She's a, a goddess of the harvest. Um, so there is that sort of revolution of dying and rising, winter and spring uh, kind of thing going on. And again, we see that sort of with Jesus. We see that with Dionysus. Um, uh, Jesus is on the right. Dionysus is in the middle. Uh, on the left is Adonis. Adonis is also sort of, uh, you know, eternal youth like young, handsome man. It's a popular way that we use the term Adonis is we refer to a, a youth uh, male that's very handsome. Like what, what a young Adonis you are. Um, that was a little seductive sounding. Um, but uh, Adonis is a dying and rising God. It's There's debate about this of how to interpret the myth, but essentially he is um, born... Uh, in the uh, living world, and he is taken to the underworld to be raised by Persephone is is one version of the story. So the fact that he travels between um, the living world and the underworld repeatedly, he sort of thought this is dying and rising God. Um, so again, the dynamics that are interesting in the mythology, um, and again, it speaks to inside of us the 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 eternal child inside of us, the the importance for us to return to the childlike state repeatedly. Uh, if we become ossified and constricted in our our behavior or our habits, if we're like too locked into adult mode, it's important for us to be able to return to the childlike state, to be reborn, and to either try new things or shake things up, or just to enjoy ourselves when we're on vacation. You know, if you've been working in the office full time for a while, you are like very much locked in like productivity mode, like adult mode, responsibility mode, and then you go on vacation and you have no idea how to get out of that mode you need to somehow flip a switch and become a child again. It's just like, we let's play. Like, uh, you know, I'm not going to think about two weeks from now. I'm just going to be, be here now. We're constantly mm -hmm. needing to sort of die and rise, die and rise. Um, in fractals, right? Going on vacation is a small way having to sort of, uh, wake from your trauma and start living again is a different way to sort of be reborn. That can be a much more overarching, grander, uh, change. I think partly what is required of an individual to not fall too far into the Puer's issues or too deeply into the rigidity of the Senex is to be able to like mediate that, you know, and we see that some of the successful mythological figures, as you're mentioning here, are the dying and rising gods or the ones who are moving between worlds like Hermes or, I mean, Jesus kind of moves in between he he died and went to hell and came back and you have persephone who die and rises again but your ability to mediate between puer archetype you know more adult senex archetype and that flow and being able to maintain that through some sort of balance is what's going to help you not get stuck in the shadowy dark aspects like some of the figures we're going to go over. Um, this is Robin Aaron from Game of Thrones. Once again, it's a great show that really demonstrates so many archetypal dynamics. But in this case, we have a very intense devouring mother figure who um, nurtures and keeps the child in her arms to such a degree that he is really stunted 
And even now as like a young youth, he breastfeeds and he's like 12 years old. Um, he seems really um, self-centered, uh, spoiled, quick to uh, an emotionality, which is fed by the mother. He can do no wrong. He can do whatever he wants. And so this is where we see a dynamic of where the, the mother-child relationship is very out of balance, um, spirited away, the big fat baby. <laughs> I don't even know it has a name, but in this movie, she's trying to keep the child safe. Um, but I like how they've oversized the child. There's something very strange about it. We don't even know if this is a normal baby. Maybe it's an, a, a, a figure that's been a baby for years and years and years. It should be an adult by now, but it's a child. But at least the imagery itself and, and the association with the mother wanting to keep hold and keep the child safe and how much that will stunt their development um, is important because it it it, it really puts a, a huge challenge for uh, the individual to be able to, to step into their own sense of self and to feel secure in it. Rather, the identification and the safety that comes from the parent is so overwhelming that they don't know how to leave the nest. Yeah, so there's there's certainly a relationship between the pueriternus and the devouring mother. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it's, it's being illustrated here that it's, it's in our mythology, it's in our stories and it's compelling, um, but that it's, it's a, a real dynamic in the real world as well, is that a lot of people who grow up, um, or excuse me, who don't grow up despite aging, uh, are, they're often that way because they had parents who spoiled them or protected them too much or tried to hold on to them, remain children, letting them get whatever they wanted at any time. Um, so there's a relationship there. It's not just, um, you know, it's not just the boy resisting. It's often the the mother or the father allowing, enabling. And even if you watch Game of Thrones, uh, Robin Aaron is still breastfeeding. He still wants to. And so like he's partly at fault, I guess you could say, for wanting to continue breastfeeding at that age. But Liza Aaron also is still producing milk, <laughs> even though she hasn't been pregnant for a very long time. Um, I don't know if that's even possible it's it's in the show for some reason but like that she's breastfeeding him and um you know in some ways that's symbolizing that she is not letting go of being this mother figure like still producing milk like milk's still ready for you baby whenever you need it yeah uh, he's becoming a teenager um so that dynamic is, is important to illustrate there's an interplay there between parent and child and even inside of us you know we might be preventing our selves from growing up uh, by over parenting ourselves, by over protecting mm. ourselves or over spoiling mm. ourselves, you know? Yeah. Some of the destructive aspects of being in the Puer psychology is that we really don't know our limits or we're constantly pushing or constantly wanting to adventure out without having that sense of healthy boundary that it brings a type of ruin or destruction. So here we have like mythological examples with Icarus on the left here. He flew too close to the sun, even though his father had counseled him against that. Don't fly too low to the sea. Don't fly too high to the sun. Um, and there tends to be this interesting symbolism around the puer of casting really high into the into the air, very ungrounded, um, wanting to get off of the earth and to then such a degree that they totally lose their sense of, of stability or they push it too far. It come, becomes almost this like Tower of Babel moment. Um, on the right side, you have Phaeton, who's the son of Helios, and he wanted to ride his father's um, chariot, which is supposed to bring the sun, you know, across the sky. And of course, he's not trained. He doesn't really know how to. And that also causes his death. Um, and one thing I'll mention, the very well-known book uh, from Von Franz, uh, The Problem of the Puer Eternus, she also relates these issues that Puers often have of scaling the heights uh, with interest in like mountaineering or flying planes. I guess this is something she's viewed clinically in, in different patients, but 
actually wanting to engage in these in a in a concretized manner to a degree that's so unsafe that eventually it might cause like a, a great accident or even death of the person. So there's this kind of like sublimatio dynamic going on where like you're wanting to sort of transcend that earthly plane into something higher, um, but it's being done in such an imbalanced way that whether mythologically expressed or realistically, the individual um, leads themselves to some sort of disastrous end. Here's baby Michael on the left. Um, you know, this is obviously one of the most um, well-known examples of Peter Pan syndrome and probably uh, the most cited example um, because he's so famous. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, Michael Jackson literally built himself a ranch called Neverland. Um, so it's quite explicitly Peter Pan syndrome. Um, but you have to wonder uh, what really happened to Michael. Uh, obviously, it's very complicated and there's, there's a huge amount of, uh, you know, documentation and books about this and whatnot. But that Michael was um, not really protected or kept in a childlike state, but it seemed almost like he was prevented from being able to enjoy being a child at all. Mm. Um, and so his, his puer side was suppressed for a very long time. He was never able to explore being a child. And then um, that when he finally was able to afford it uh, and, you know, take control of his own life, the, the, the sort of um, the disintegrated puer kind of exploded back out and kind of, uh, you know, took hold of him in a way where it hadn't been properly integrated and was expressing itself in all these weird dysfunctional ways. So it's an interesting case just to kind of study and, and make sense of, of what, what happened here. What was the psychology of Michael Jackson? Yeah. Uh, this is a uh, Hikoro Mori. Uh, again, just more, more real life examples. This is a, <clears throat> There's obviously examples in every culture, every every modernized, uh, industrialized culture is going to have this, but um, <clears throat> Ikonomori is referring to um, young men who essentially withdraw from the world and they become recluses and they uh, don't want to grow up. So they, they do whatever they can to kind of create a sort of protective nest where they can sort of stay a child forever. Um, and, you know, you can see junk food and porn and uh musical instruments and whatnot and a lot of things that a, a young boy would like to just keep around play with forever and not have to go to work and here he is sitting around with a, a samurai sword as well um strange um sort of exaggerated symbols of manhood mm. so there's a lot of interesting dynamics here but uh that again in every industrialized nation there's 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 patterns of this going on that um probably have to do with wealth if if a nation is wealthy and if there's a lot of uh, if there's a big safety net for people essentially and there might be like you know a literal financial safety net but there's also just sort of the safety of the city where you're not really in danger of um being exposed to nature and having it kill you from starvation or thirst or disease um you're protected from the danger of the past of the, of the old world. And so you're allowed to like not really grow up if you don't want to. Mm. And so we're seeing that more and more, I think as time goes on and probably will continue to see that. And the reasons for that are complicated. I think the internet also has something to do with it. Um, as a strange place where you don't have to ever grow up and you can remain your uh, virtual avatar forever and not have to stay grounded in your, you know, flesh body that actually ages and dies and has needs. Um, that's complicated though. That's another episode. <laughs> we wanted to close out today's talk by looking at tarot and where do we see the aspects of Puer, Puella? Um, this is a great question that someone asked. Someone asked it last week too about Kronos or like the Senex archetype. So maybe we'll continue to bring tarot into the conversation. Um, We've talked a lot about the fool um, in his youthful trickster form with some of the other figures like Napoleon, Dynamite, um, Hermes, um, 
really the the fool is like the quintessential divine child archetype in the tarot and is like the point of initiation that begins this journey of development and as that initiating first step there's a purity to the fool right like there's this sense of childlike wonder that allows you to be encased in the depth of potential that the world holds that's why the fool is such a powerful archetype in the deck because anything seems possible when the fool is present but if you look at the symbolism that the card shows you see that he's sort of walking off a cliffside and there is this idea that you straddle this very tenuous line between suspending reality or sort of shutting out reality to be able to be in the place of potential possibility childlike wonder and here we don't know what happens to the fool right there's a sense that he'll walk off the edge and maybe something magical will happen or maybe he'll open his eyes and turn around the other way the point being that to be in the divine child is to in some ways be within that space where the world as it is is not a factor but the world as it could be is what is most important. And that's what that focus is. That's what this, this snapshot of the fool really shows us. So that relates back to that divine child or that puer. Um, and the sun on the right side, uh, I think this is the only card that actually has like an actual baby on it. Um, and we're looking at the right away deck here is about like rising of consciousness and the sense of, of energy sort of being born back within an individual, that kind of rising of not only a sense of of personal power, as I tend to see with the sun, but also this feeling of life really coming alive. And so we definitely see puer child aspects in, in both of these cards. A couple of more. Um, Aaron, do you want to talk about the Ten of Cups? Ten of Cups on the left, um, children are playing. Uh, this is kind of like the happy family arriving at paradise. They presumably own this land and own that house and the river and they've arrived. And, um, you know, it, it illustrates that the complete life, archetypally speaking, you know, it, 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 this could be argued in different ways in, in, mo in modernity and in, in modern times, but the complete life really involves a new generation um mm. and you know historically that's thought of as being you know your children your blood is is something that you create and you carry the torch and you pass it on to them and that's actually what a complete life is it's not just growing old and dying but like growing old and then being reborn in your children and yeah. um you know i think this is true mythologically uh, but it's also true just genetically and even sort of metaphysically is that you, know, you are your father and you are your son and you are your son's son. You're, you're all sort of the same genes. And so you're kind of being reborn as you have children. So the, the complete life not only involves returning to the childlike state inside of us in a sort of more metaphorical sense, but the, like returning to the childlike form in the form of literal children um, and that the, the puer is important in that way to be present in your life. Even if you don't end up having kids, it's it's important that you interpret your life as having some sort of um, passing of the torch to the next generation, whatever that means. Otherwise, you know, the human race goes extinct. Watch children and men uh, <laughs> yeah. to see that, to see that depicted. Yeah. A couple more cards just to briefly go over. Six of Cups, which often surrounds themes of connection, security, happiness, joy, and ease, um, but also like fixation on the past or sort of a stalling or blocking of change and growth due to something that prevents you really from regenerating the kind of energy of emotionality or relationship to something. So especially in its um, sort of more like reversed or darker shadowy expressions. The Six of Cups is kind of being stuck in that childlike state in a way that prevents you from 
rebalancing and reharmonizing. And similar also with the Four of Pentacles, the next card here, we see a, an association or a tie to something that is preventing growth or stability this time more in like that earthly element. And although this card I think can be a slower moving expression of growth and uh, sort of meaningful measured development, there's also like this uh, selfish resistant quality. And if you, if you look at the card then through, through that lens, you see them holding on so tightly to each of those pentacles, really resisting what it means to uh, be challenged or to go some somewhere that feels uncomfortable. So all of those kind of get us into Puer aspects and the seven of swords, the last one on the right here. This is a really complicated card and probably deserves like its own episode, but in some ways the seven of swords in a more positive sense that like lone wolf is like the ability to like know who you are, know what you want, stick to that is like really important for the queer. I think that's where a lot of that powerful aspects of the heroic attitude come from. But when that goes out of balance and it becomes very deceptive or it becomes very, um, it, it moves into a place where you sort of take from others, which sometimes the Seven of Swords can speak to this ability to come into people's life and have such a strong identification with your own needs, what's right for you, your own path, that you sort of take what you need and then you keep on going. And that can be that same aspect of the Puer who sort of moves from relationship to relationship, taking what they need and never truly grounding into another person and sacrificing for them as well. Lastly, the pages, they are puers because they are the children of the deck. They are the youthful first step in the sort of psychological arc of development that we see in the court card. So they always represent potential, possibility, education, roots, grounding. They are the puer and it's really pure, powerful form of new journeys, um, walking a path with a lot of openness, interest, and a feeling of all that life could offer you. So they're, they're in some ways like fractal expressions of the fool, but brought down to a more concrete level. So the pages are puers and, and usually their most balanced form as they're really starting out on a journey of potential and growth and have yet to fully run into any major issues yet. All right. That's it. Um, a lot of information in there. I hope it was useful. Um, we're way over time. We're not going to take any questions um, this week, um, but hope to see you next time. Uh, hope usually around the same time next week. And again, if you have any topics you'd like us to cover, um, you can let us know in the chat right now as this episode ends, or you can get in touch with us on Twitter or Instagram. So thanks everyone for showing up and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. If you find our content useful, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash golden shadow org. If you'd like to keep up with my explorations, musings, and stay updated on the project, subscribe to the Golden Shadow Journal at goldenshadow.substack.com. Thanks for watching. See you later.